Good morning. Let's all join together and sing All Creatures of Our God and King, hymn number 62. Amen. Please be seated. We are glad to see you this morning as we gather for worship here at Grace United Methodist Church. We do want to know who is worshiping with us. We want to know who you are. So if you are worshiping with us in person, we'd like to invite you to take the tear-off section of your bulletin and complete it and drop it in the plate so that we can know who is worshiping with us today. If you're watching us online, we'd love for you to leave us a comment. We'd love for you to share it on your page so that others can worship with, uh, with you. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. As we begin, there are a um, few things that I want to mention. You will see all of our announcements on the back of your bulletin. Very important, uh, Grace, the office has a new email address, so please update your records and the new office, the new address is there for you on both the front and the back of your bulletin, so please update your information and let us know. It'd be great if you have a few minutes to send us an email to verify your um, current email address as well as to make sure that, that you can get in touch with us. 
Also want to remind you that the fifth Sunday churchwide luncheon is following, follows worship in the Christian Life Center. So we'd love for you to stay and join us for that. We'd like to invite everyone to stay, that there's going to be plenty of food if you're our guest. I know we have some guests that are with us who are working out at the OWL with the Nomad program and some others. We'd love for you to stay and eat with us um, so, so that will immediately follow worship. Also, last week was the kickoff for our Christmas shoebox campaign. So there are empty boxes out there as well as some information about what to pack. Those are due November 13th, so you only have a couple of weeks to get those ready. Tomorrow night is the trunk or treat, so we, there's still time if you would like to buy some candy and join us for that. Um, we'd be glad to have you. That's from 5.30 to 7 tomorrow. Um, Friendship Club meets this Tuesday, games at 10, a meal at noon, so enjoy, come and enjoy the food and fellowship with them. Um, also today is the, um, the culmination of our stewardship campaign. We would invite you to place your completed estimate of giving cards and opportunity of ministry, uh, opportunities for ministry brochures in the baskets near the entrances. There are extras available. There are pencils in the pew. So if you left yours at home or you didn't receive your letter in the mail or something of that nature, there are extras. And we'd invite you to take a few moments and pray about what God is calling you to give to support our work in 2023, as well as how God is calling you to serve as we um, seek to make a difference in our community and beyond. Our fall Bible study is coming to a close over the next couple of weeks. So um, we'll meet at 1030 on Wednesday and 6 o'clock on Thursday. We also want to say a very special welcome to Francis Grafton, who is filling in on the piano for us this morning. So welcome, Francis, and thank you for helping us. So that's some of the things that are going on in the life of our church this week. It's a busy week. Are there other announcements that we need to mention this morning? All right. I'd like to invite you then to turn with me in your bulletin to our opening prayer and join with me as we pray together. You will also find the words on your screen. And so let us join together in prayer. O oh, holy God, open unto me light for my darkness, courage for my fear, hope for my despair. O oh, loving God, open unto me wisdom for my confusion, forgiveness for my sins, love for my hate. O God of peace, open unto me peace for my turmoil, joy for my sorrow, strength for my weakness. O generous God, open my heart to receive all your gifts. Amen. And now I would like to invite you to stand as we affirm our faith together using the affirmation from 1 Corinthians and Colossians. You'll find it on page 888 in the back of your hymnal. The words will also be on your screen. I'll start and then invite you to join with me as we affirm our faith together. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things to God. Amen. be seated as our ushers come to receive our offering this morning and as they come let us be in prayer.
Oh, Lord, we are so grateful for the many blessings that you have given us. And, Lord, as we think about what you are calling us to give back to you, we know that we can never outgive you, that what you have given us is so wonderful, that you have given us so many blessings of family and friends, of gathering for worship. Lord, we know that you have given us so much, and so we give because of what you have given us. And so, Lord, as we think about all that you have given us, we give you back a portion of what you have blessed us with so that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. stand. Please remain standing as we join together in singing freely, freely, hymn number 389.
please be seated. As we come to a time of prayer in our service, I want to remind you of our prayer list that is on the back of your bulletin. I'd like to encourage you to take that home with you and continue to pray for those folks and those um, groups throughout the week. After all, one of the vows that we take is to pray. And so we wanted to give you an opportunity to do that and to continue to pray for those needs that are present in our community as well as in our lives. So those are before you. There are a couple of things that I want to specifically mention to you. There are several of our sister churches who will be voting today if they would like to remain in the United Methodist Church or to disaffiliate. And so we want to pray for them as they make those important decisions today. And we will be voting at a special in called session of annual conference on November the 12th. <clears throat> so on those churches that choose to disaffiliate this fall. <clears throat> I believe um, that it will be online. I believe it will be streamed on the Louisiana Conference Facebook page um, or at least on the YouTube channel if you're interested in watching those proceedings on November 12th. Also this week, um, pray for the delegates to the South Central Jurisdiction, which will be, me be meeting November 2nd through 5th um, in Houston, Texas. One of the things that is done at South Central Jurisdiction is the election and appointment of bishops. And so by this time next week, we will know um, who our bishop will be in Louisiana, if we will keep the same bishop or have a, a new bishop, or, and, and if we will have a resident bishop or we'll share a bishop with another annual conference. And so, so they have some very important decisions to make this week, and I hope that you will pray for them and for that meeting. We did have a Louisiana Tech Wesley Foundation board meeting this week, and that ministry continues to go um, well, reaching out to those students on campus, and um, so we are excited to be a part of that, ask you to continue to pray for their work. So those are some of the things that are on my mind this morning. We want to continue to pray for so many that are ill for... Luann Davis, who is recovering from surgery, and others that are just under the weather. I know that the um, uh, that respiratory viruses for children is really bad right now. I've heard a little bit about some flu going around also, so, um, so we'd encourage you to sanitize your hands and be careful and to pray for those who are sick. So are there others who are in need of our prayers this morning that are on your mind today? For Catherine Smith. Okay. Others this morning. Okay. Then let us join together in prayer. Oh Lord, we are grateful to be in your house. We are grateful for the day that you've given us, for the rain that came yesterday, for the cooler temperatures. Lord, we are so grateful for all your many blessings. And Lord, as we think about what you have given us and what you are calling us to give, Lord, we're reminded of Paul's book in 2 Corinthians where he writes about the Macedonians giving sacrificially and giving cheerfully to help others in need, others in Jerusalem that lived a long way away from them, that didn't have the same background, maybe didn't look the same, and yet they cheerfully and willingly gave to help others. And so, Lord, as we Think about what you are calling us to give of ourselves, of our time, of our talents, of, um, of our money. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful to the example of all of those Christians who have gone before us and left us such a great heritage of faith, who gave not only for themselves, but they gave for us so that we could know the good news of Jesus Christ, so that we could know his grace his mercy, his love and forgiveness. And so, Lord, we we pray that the things that that we give our time, our talents, our money, Lord, it would make a difference in the lives of others for you, just as someone did for us. And Lord, as we gather in your house this morning, we are mindful of the needs that are all around us. Maybe it is. We do pray for our world situation that, that worries us. We do continue to pray for so many in our community that are sick. Um, Lord, we, we lift them up to you. Maybe they're recovering from surgery, facing surgery. Lord, we know that you are the great healer, and so we, we lift them up to you. We also rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and we give thanks for the, the new gift and to um, the Davis's life and to so many others' lives. And Lord, we are so grateful for your many blessings. 
Lord, we are also mindful of those who have lost a loved one to death. And we ask your comfort, your peace that passes understanding to be with them. And Lord, as we gather in your house this morning, we are mindful of your presence with us. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and lead us and to be among us, to draw us closer to you and to one another. Lord, most of all, we are grateful that you love us, that you care for us, and that you hear us when we pray. And it's all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And would the children come down for the children's sermon? Okay, can everybody hear me? I think so. All right, so we have been talking about the vows that United Methodist members take, and this week we're talking about the vow to give. So the Bible tells us that we should, uh, that the one who plants only a little will gather only a little, and the one who plants a lot will gather a lot. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. You shouldn't give if you don't want to. You shouldn't give because you are forced to, because God loves a cheerful giver. So what do you think that means? Cheerful. You don't want to talk in the microphone. I don't blame you. I don't really love talking in the microphone either. So you think it means to give people things. Do you think it means that, like, if your mom says, Arthur, I want you to give them all your toys. And you're like, no, Mom, I don't want to do that. Do you think that you should still do it? You think so? Well, actually, the Bible tells us that you don't have to do that. God doesn't want us to give things even if we don't want to. He wants us to give things because we want to give them. And it's, so that's what he's talking about when he says being a cheerful giver. And you know what else it tells you? That if you give, then you will also receive. It also tells us that your gifts meet the needs of the Lord's people. And that's not all. Your gifts also cause many people to be thankful to God. So last Sunday, Miss Rebecca told us about the shoe boxes. Do you remember that? Operation Christmas Child? Oh, you were you were sick. That's right. You had strep throat. Well, I know that your dad took home two shoe boxes. Did he tell you anything about those shoe boxes? No. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you about them. So in those shoe boxes, we put gifts for children. And some of them are things that, like, they just need, like pencils and pens and erasers. But some things are in there are toys and things like that. And we put those in there, and we send them to children all over the world who are in need. And when they open those boxes, they're so excited and they get all these cool things. But the most important thing that they get from those boxes is they see them and they realize that somebody somewhere around the world cared enough to give them a gift. And because they think, hmm, why would somebody who doesn't even know me want to give me a gift? And then that opens the door for missionaries to tell them about Jesus and the gift that God gave us through him. Do you know what gift God gave us? He did. He gave us life. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Right? And through our gifts, we're able to show other people what God has done for us. Does that sound good? 
So do you think that you might want to fill a shoebox? Okay, and your mom's not going to have to like force you to do it, right? Because you're going to be a cheerful giver. <laughs> All right, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to be our Savior, the most wonderful gift that you could have ever given us. Lord, we pray that you will help us in all our actions and in all our deeds to glorify you and show others how much you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, choir. Well, over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the vows that we take as United Methodists. We will finish that next week when we talk about witness. We will also uh, remember all those members who have joined the Church Eternal next week for All Saints Sunday, as well we'll have a guest from the Seared Street Shelter next week. So we have another busy week next Sunday, and we hope that you will join us um, again next Sunday. Today we're going to read out of the book of 2 Corinthians two separate passages. We're going to start in chapter 8 verses 1 through 15 and then look at chapter 9 verses 6 through 15. Uh, both of them are related to giving and so I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from 2 Corinthians this morning. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. 
And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to, be, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. And now in chapter 9. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing, surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In its January 25th, 1988 issue of Time, the magazine provided insight on the importance of giving and sharing. Speaking about the introduction of the video cassette recorder, the VCR, the article said the Sony company had made a crucial mistake. While at first Sony kept its beta technology mostly to itself, JVC, the Japanese inventor of the VHS format, shared its secret with a raft of other firms. As a result, the market was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of VHS machines being produced. This drastically undercut Sony's market share. The first year, Sony lost 40% of the market, and by 1987, it controlled only 10% of the market. Sony eventually had to jump on the VHS bandwagon, and while now it's almost impossible to find a VHS machine, this episode demonstrates that even in a cutthroat business like technology and entertainment, 
giving has its rewards. If it's true in business, how much more true will it be in the kingdom of God? You see, giving doesn't begin when I put a check in the offering plate on Sunday or when we draft your bank account. Giving began when God gave his only son for us. Giving begins when I give my heart and life to Jesus to serve him. Our financial generosity is only an indicator of our relationship to God. One of the most used books and one of the thickest books in my library is a concordance. And the concordance shows where different words are located throughout the Bible and how many times a word is used. And yes, somebody with way more time than me counted each and every word in the Bible and listed it and put it in one book. Okay? So when one looks up believing in the concordance, it is used 272 times throughout the Bible. Prayer, praying is found 371 times. Love, loving, 714 times. But give, giver, giving is found 2,162 times throughout the Bible. That means that there are three times more instances of the use of give than love, seven times used more often than prayer, eight times used more often than belief in the Bible. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of every six verses deals with money. Of the 29 parables that Jesus told, 16 deal with a person and his money or his possessions. I think that clearly demonstrates the importance that God places on the concept of giving. And we give because he first gave to us. So over the last few weeks, we have been talking about stewardship. And, and I want you to think of stewardship as all that we give to the church and to Jesus. What if we thought of stewardship as more than just what we put in the offering plate, as important as that is? But what if we thought of stewardship as a way of life? And so this morning... We continue a message series examining the membership vows each member makes to the church and how we can live them out. Each person who has joined the United Methodist Church after 2008 vows to support the church in five ways. Their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service, and their witness. Now, Merriam-Webster defines vow as a solemn pr promise or assertion, specifically one by which a person is bound to an act, a service, or a condition. So when we take a vow, we are binding ourselves to fulfill the vow and live up to what we have said. This morning, we're going to focus on gifts. Now, this word gifts could refer to spiritual gifts, the talents and abilities that God has given us, uh, God has given to us. Or it could refer to our financial gifts, our treasures, our money, which is another way that we support the church and offer our gifts to God. These gifts are two sides of the same coin. The financial resources that we have are ours because of the talents and the abilities and the health and the benefits that God has blessed us with. Both are gifts from God. Both should be used to give glory to God and used to support the work of God's church. We're going to talk about both today. We're going to start with gifts of the Spirit. We're going to start with gifts of the Spirit. Now, the term gifts often brings to mind money. But actually, there's much more to gifts than just money. This is what Reverend Taylor Burton Edwards writes. It's not just about finances. Gifts are about our whole lives. That includes our spiritual gifts. That includes the talents we have. That includes everything that we've received from anybody. We offer all of that to God. 
How does your life become a channel of God's overflowing gifts to you and through you to the world? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7 reads this way. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. All of our gifts are needed. They are all given to us for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us some basic information about spiritual gifts. That there is a diversity of gifts, but they all come from the Holy Spirit. They are given for a unity of purpose, even though the gifts are different. The purpose is to build up the body of Christ. Now, we should not say, well, well, preacher, I don't have any gifts. I don't have anything to offer for the building up of the body of Christ. Scripture makes it clear that each one of us, every one of us, has something that God has given us that we can offer for the good of building up of the body. If we are not using our gifts to build the body, it's not because we lack them. It's because we are not putting what God has given us to work. There are at least four places in the New Testament where there are lists of spiritual gifts. If you add them together, you come up with a list of about 25 to 30 spiritual gifts. Often spiritual gift tests or inventories only include those 25 through 30, but that is certainly not all that there are. Those lists should be seen as representative of the kinds of gifts that God can give, not as exhaustive of all the gifts that God has already given us. But all of those gifts have been given to us by God, and they can all be used for the glory of God. Besides those spiritual gifts, we have, may have learned skills or talents that can help the church. What church can't benefit from the abilities of a tech-savvy person? We are so grateful for the folks that help us in the sound booth, and we're so grateful for our musicians. We are so grateful for our choir. We are so grateful for those of you that offer up your time and your talents to teach Sunday school or to lead a Bible study. All of those things are ways that we can put our talents to work in the church. There are a group of ladies that you might have met if you were come on Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings. They meet here three times a week and they go into a room and they make mats for the homeless. I'm sure that if you are free on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday that they'd love for you to join them and they could put you to work. Don't ask, don't I know that for sure because every time I go in there to visit, they say, don't stay, preacher. We'll give you something to do. So so I know that they can put you to work. You see, that's why we created this Opportunities for Ministry brochure for you to pray about, for you to think about, to give you an opportunity to put what God has given you to work in the church. Every gift that we have can be used for the glory of God and the building up of the church. Now, the temptation, I think, is for us to say, well, because I don't have this gift, because I can't carry a tune in a bucket, because I don't like to speak in public, then, then maybe my gifts are not as important as other gifts. Now, of course, there are some gifts that attract more attention than others, like preaching or leadership or any kind of other obvious gift. But the behind-the-scenes gifts like prayer or encouragement or wise counsel or even just spending time with one another are just as needed. Spiritual gifts are not just to be used for our own good, but they are, should be used for the benefit of others and the building up of the body of Christ. So whatever gifts you have, whatever gifts I have, whatever gifts we have together, they should be used for the glory of God and for the benefit of the community of Christ. So spiritual gifts are one of the resources that we have to support the ministries of God's church. Secondly, there is also our financial gifts. Another way that we can support the church is through our financial gifts. 
And for a discussion of that, we turn to 2 Corinthians. Now, 2 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth while he was on his third missionary journey through Macedonia and Greece and Asia Minor. Minor. Today, we, it would be Turkey on the map today. And it, the eventual end point for this journey was to be in Jerusalem. And one of the purposes of that journey was to collect an offering from the mostly Gentile congregations in those regions to benefit the mostly Jewish church in Jerusalem. Notice that they were not the same, that the one was Gentile and one was Jewish, but it didn't matter. They were working for the same Lord, and so they gave to support even though it was not, one was not like the other. You see, Judea had been hard hit by drought and famine in the middle of the first century. And Christians, being a religious minority, were particularly hard hit. It was also a way to build unity in an oft-divided early church. Now, it was the Corinthians who had first proposed the collection. But Paul writes that they had failed to follow through. Meanwhile, the Macedonians, who had, were poor compared to the Corinthians, had come through in a big way. So Paul lifts the Macedonians up as an example of generosity. Now, we're probably a bit uncomfortable with that, saying that one has done well and another one has not done quite so well. But the fact of the matter is that we learn good behavior from good examples. So Paul is holding up this Macedonian church and, and he's saying, yeah, they're, they're struggles, they, they're poor, but look what they've done. Why don't you follow their lead? Unless we see examples of faithfulness and generosity and giving, we're unlikely to learn the behavior for ourselves. So this morning I have two questions about giving that I want to ask and offer some thoughts upon. First, why do we give? Why do we give? We give because we serve a generous Savior who is the supreme example of generosity. Christ laid aside the wealth of heaven to become a poor servant that through his suffering we might become rich in grace. I hope you noticed in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, the, the end of the chapter, Paul can't even find words to describe the gift that God has given us in Jesus. So he simply ends his thought by saying, thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. Isn't that just like God to give us an undescribable gift, the ones that we can't find words for? We give because we have been given to. We give because God has first given the spiritual gifts we have, our talents, our abilities, our health, our very lives are not ours alone. They are gifts from God. We are simply stewards using what God has given us. How selfish would it be for us to not return some of what we have been given to God? We also give to express our love for God. If we have received love from God, it should prompt us to express love and return. And giving is a way to do that. Jesus himself said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Our use of our treasure reveals what is most valuable to us. If I wanted to know what is important to you, I would look at two things, your checkbook and your day planner or your, the calendar on your phone. Because the way that we spend our time and our money, that shows what we, is important to us. Our use of our treasure reveals what is most valuable to us. Giving is an act of faith. It's an act of trust in God to be able to say, Lord, I know that the world is crazy right now. I know that inflation is bad. I don't know what the future holds. But what I do know is that I can trust you. And I know the best investment I can make is to invest in the kingdom of God because that's going to build up treasure not here on earth, but in, in heaven. And so we give as an act of faith. Secondly, we ask, well, how do we give? How do we give? And, and here in 2 Corinthians, there are at least five principles of God honoring giving, and I want to go through them quickly and briefly. 
First, I want you to see that giving is a privilege. Chapter 8, verse 4 says the Macedonians begged for the privilege of sharing in the ministry. How interesting. Do we think of it as a privilege to give? Do we come to church and we say, yes, I get to put my offering in the plate today. Are we realize what a privilege it is to have a part in what God is doing? Maybe we should. Giving means that I have been blessed enough to have something to share. My time, talents, gifts, service, and witness. It is also a privilege to participate in the work through our financial gifts. As many of you know, I have been a Rotarian for over 15 years, and I'm a proud member of the Ruston Rotary Club, where you, where you will find me on most Wednesdays at lunch. I have served as president of two Rotary Clubs in Kentwood and in Winfield. October 25th was a day called World Polio Day, celebrating all that Rotary has done to eliminate this terrible disease that strikes when a person is a child, but affects them throughout their entire lives. Thanks to the work of Rotary and other organizations, the disease has almost been eliminated, except in countries where we cannot get in to give the necessary vaccine. Through my Rotary dues and gifts, it is a great privilege to have been just a small part of that work. It's the same for the church. You may not be able to go to Sanibel Island, Florida and muck out a house as some of our ERT folks did just a couple of weeks ago. You may not be able to go up to where a tornado is going to strike next. But what you can do is that you can give. You may not be a nomad and you can travel in your RV all over the place and work at the Owl to make salsa and jelly and all the things that they're doing out there. But what we can do is that we can give. We may not be able to go with our youth to camp or, or take a week off of work to be a chaperone, but we can give. What if we thought of giving as more of a privilege and less of a chore? How would that change our lives? How would that change our gifts? First, I want you to see giving as a privilege. Secondly, Paul says that we should give freely. In chapter 8, verse 3, he says that the Macedonians gave voluntarily. If we, are, if we give under any compulsion but the impulse of the Holy Spirit, we aren't really giving. We are paying our dues. High-pressure sales pitches have no place in the church, though unfortunately they do sometimes happen. You won't find me trying to guilt you into giving, but I am going to let you know that we have a need and you have an opportunity to be a part of what we're doing here. We should give freely. We should also give proportionately, and that's number three, give proportionately. Paul says that the Macedonians gave according to their means and even beyond their means in chapter 8, verse 3. So how much should we give? Well, there is no set amount. Thank God there is no entrance fee to heaven or to faith. If there were, none of us could afford it. Nor do we need to, because Jesus has already paid the full cost. We all have different gifts and capabilities, and that includes our financial resources. Like you, I know how much more expensive it is for almost everything recently, be it gas or at the grocery store or anywhere else. I know what that does to our budget. I can only imagine what it does to yours. And we don't say it enough, but I want you to know how much I appreciate your gifts of time and talent, your financial gifts, your service. Paul is clear that we should give according to our means to what God has given us, maybe even beyond them. God measures our giving by our ability to give, not in dollars and cents. We should give proportionately. Which brings us to the fourth point. We should give sacrificially. We should give sacrificially. God is especially honored by our, by our giving when we give out of more than just our excess. When we make a commitment, when we say, God, this is how much I'm going to give. I personally believe in tithing. The giving of our, the first 10% of our earnings back to God. That's an example of proportional giving. 
But I also believe that we should see tithing as the first word and not the last word on giving. In fact, I actually think that giving back to God 10% of what he has given us is a pretty good deal. Because when we did our taxes this year, the government required much more than just 10%. So that should be a starting place. Let us go beyond it and give sacrificially. Lastly, give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Paul's encouragement in chapter 9 verse 7 is to give as you have made up your own mind. You get to choose, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving should be a joy and not a chore. It should be a joyful way to express our thanks to God for all of his gifts to us. What if we gave joyfully? What if we gave out of our excess? What if, we, what if we gave because God gave to us? We have received more from God than we could ever give back. So our financial gifts matter. Each week as we have considered these vows and what they mean, I, I've been wanting to give you some practical ideas of how we can live them out every day. Now, certainly, I'm still learning. I'm still, I'm not perfect. I fall short of where I should be also. So this challenge is for me as much as it is for you. Last Sunday, a card with our stewardship series was placed inside your bulletin, or you might have received one in the mail this week with a letter talking about some of the things that we used your gifts to do in 2022. Don't worry if you forgot yours at home. There are extras on the, the back, um, on this near the back, near the, near, the, near, the, near the baskets where we're asking you to place your completed card. There are extras if you forgot to bring yours with you. But this is what I want to do, is I want to invite you to consider how God is calling you to live out the vows that you've taken and how you can be a part of what God is doing at Grace through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. I'd like to invite you to drop your completed card of your estimate of giving for 2023 and to, to drop your completed opportunities for ministry brochure in the basket. There's one at near the doors. There's some, several in the North X. You'll even see some baskets in the CLC when you go over for lunch. You can also mail it to us. You can bring it by to the church office at your convenience. But we want to offer you the opportunity, the privilege of being a part of what God is doing in this place. And we want to say thank you for all that you do. Most of all, we are thankful for what God has done for us and for the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here in our community and beyond. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, when we truly stop and think about all that you have given us, we know that we can never, ever give you as much as you have given us. We are so grateful for the gift that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. And as we think about what you are calling us to give back to your work through our service, give back to your work through our financial gifts, give back to your work through inviting someone to come and be a part of what you are doing here at our church. Lord, we are so grateful that we can have just a small part in what you are doing. Lord, we ask your blessing on us, that you would help us to be cheerful givers, that you would lead us and guide us to know that we're not under any compulsion, that we're not under any kind of, of guilt trip, but Lord, we, we want to be a part of what you're doing. And so we ask that you would bless these gifts that we give, these commitments that we make, and Lord, that you would help us to keep them as we seek to follow Jesus today and every day. And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we come to a time of response in our service, the altar is open if you would like to come and pray. Maybe you would like to come and pray about what God is calling you to give or where God is calling you to serve. I'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to do so. I'd also be glad to talk with you if you'd like to know more about trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior or to become a member of our church as we seek to make a difference here in Ruston and beyond. Our closing hymn is number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth, For the Beauty of the Skies. Would you please stand as we sing together number 92.
amen. We are glad that you have chosen to join with us today in worship, and thank you for being with us. I do want to remind you that the fifth Sunday lunch follows down in the CLC, so we'd invite you to stay for that. That'll give you plenty of time to work on your opportunities for ministry brochure, your estimate of giving card if you haven't done so yet, and want to remind you to please drop those in the basket as you depart. So um, we'd love for you to stay and eat with us, and this, will, this closing prayer will also serve as the blessing for the meal. So please make your way down to the, the gym and get started. So let's pray together. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for all that you have given us, that you have given us your son, Jesus Christ, and that you have paid a price that we could never pay, to, that we might have forgiveness and grace and mercy and hope. And so, Lord, as we give back to you just a portion of what you've given us, Lord, through service, through our time, through our talents, through our gifts, Lord, we ask your blessings on what we give, that others would see Jesus in us. And so, Lord, as we go, we pray that you would go with us and that others would see Jesus in us through all that we do and say. And it's these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.